Welcome. Uh, we're here to talk to you about the uh, MVVM toolkit. Um, and so my name is uh, Michael A. Hawker. I'm also known as the uh, XAML Llama. And uh, that's why I wear the hat here. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer at Microsoft. I've been there for over 10 years uh, and I'm the maintainer of the Windows Community Toolkit, which we'll talk about in a second if you're not aware of it. Uh, I also created an app called uh, XAML Studio. And with me today is Sergio, who's one of our community members who's been working with us on the toolkit. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Sergio Pedri. I'm a computer engineering student and a member of the .NET Foundation and the Windows Community Toolkit org. Uh, I've been working with Michael for these last few months, uh, contributing to the Windows Community Toolkit. And I'm the author and maintainer of the MVVM Toolkit, which we're presenting today, uh, as well as the high performance package, which is part of the toolkit. I'm also the author of Legend and OneLocker, which are two uh, UWP apps which are published in the Microsoft Store. Great, so just an overview for our talk today, we're gonna introduce you to the Windows Community Toolkit if you're not aware of that. Uh, also talk about a brief overview of MVVM itself. Uh, in case you're not aware, we wanna uh, introduce everyone and bring everyone up to, uh, to speed on, on what this pattern is. Uh, and then of course about the MVVM Toolkit itself um, and what that is and, and where, why we built it, uh, as well as giving a demo on its capabilities and talking a little bit about our future plans for the toolkit, uh, uh, the MVVM Toolkit and the Windows Community Toolkit. So uh, for those of you not aware, the Windows Community Toolkit is a suite of controls, extensions, and helpers, uh, mainly focused at Windows development, um, for, so UWP, but we also have a lot of .NET standard stuff now, such as the, the, the toolkit we're going to be talking about today, uh, as well as some other .NET uh, standard helpers that have been uh, contributed uh, over, over time. So there's a lot of uh, very useful tools for everyone there. Uh, we're part of the .NET Foundation, and uh, all the work we do is open sourced under MIT license on GitHub. And so uh, we've, we've been doing a lot over the last four years. We've had over 25 releases, uh, over a thousand issues closed. Uh, we've got over 5 million NuGet package uh, downloads across all of our various different offerings um, with over 10,000 commits from over 200 contributors. So we're really happy with um, the growth of the community and, and all the community contributions we've got to this project uh, over time. And so uh, if you're not familiar with the project, we do have a sample app that's in the Microsoft Store. You can download it. You can see different uh, um, playgrounds for our controls and helpers, try things out in the app, see the documentation, even edit uh, any of the XAML pieces live, uh, see how things react, and then copy those into uh, wherever you need them in your applications. And so with that, I'm going to hand things over to Sergio to give a brief introduction to uh, the MVVM pattern and what it is and, and how it can be used in your applications. Thanks, Michael. Then let me turn on my video. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so uh, we thought we'd start with a brief introduction of the MVVM pattern for those of you that are not familiar with it or for those of you that simply have not used it before. Uh, so MVVM is a software architectural pattern that can be used to uh, develop applications. And its main purpose is to basically to help separate concerns. So uh, the core idea here is to uh, structure the code base of the application into uh, three different components, uh, which are then loosely, loosely coupled. Uh, these three main components we can see here are the model, the view, and the view model. Uh, the view would be the uh, UI layer of your application. Uh, the view model would be the application logic. And then the model would be uh, the business logic or the application domain. So again, the idea here is to have these various components interact with each other in a loosely coupled fashion. So this uh, is meant to make a number of tasks uh, easy to perform, uh, such as doing maintenance on the code base, um, developing different features at the same time. Uh, it also helps with code reusability and code testability and more. Uh, here. here we can see um, a simple diagram that illustrates the uh, various building blocks of the MVVM architecture and how these various building blocks interact with each other. So uh, the first means of communication we have uh, are bindings, uh, which we can see here between the view and the view model and the view and the model. So bindings are a way to um, relay values of different properties uh, across different objects. And they also allow uh, these properties to send notification to um, notify uh, the UI components uh, that they, their value has changed in order for them to react dynamically to these changes. Uh, this is opposed to, for instance, having the UI layer uh, constantly pull the backend to check whether or not a given property has changed or not. 
Uh, so uh, to make an example, you might imagine an application which is a media player. Uh, in this case, you might want to display a list of tracks uh, to play. And then so you, you might have uh, a list control in your UI which binds uh, to a collection of tracks which is loaded in the uh, view model. And instead you might have uh, bindings between the view and the model where the model might be a single track to play, uh, where you might have a template that's used to display a single track. And then you might have bindings between uh, different subcomponents of this template. So for instance, uh, you might have uh, text labels to display the title of the track, the artist of the track, and so on. Uh, the second means of communication we can see here are commands. Now, commands are a way to um, abstract operations that are done in the uh, view model and to expose them to the UI, again, in a loosely coupled fashion. So the idea here is to um, provide an additional layer of abstraction so that it, it also, uh, it's also easier to um, modify aspects of the back end without also having to modify the front end. Uh, additionally, commands also uh, include a number of features such as being able to notify the UI uh, about whether or not they can be executed at any given time. So uh, as an example, you might imagine a button that binds uh, its command property to a command uh, wrapping a method in the view model. And then this button might want to dynamically react to, um, to indicate to the user whether or not it can actually be clicked uh, at any given time. Moving on here, uh, we have uh, another con connection from the uh, view model to the model. Uh, in this case, we just indicated code interactions. Uh, so here, what we mean by this is that the view model is typically uh, responsible for directly interacting with models. So uh, it can do so in order to uh, modify instances of models, and it can also interact with uh, backend services. So for instance, uh, a view model might be able to uh, modify models and then serialize them and store them, for instance, in a database uh, to relay actions that were requested by users. Lastly here, uh, we have another connection from the model to the uh, view model. Uh, in this case, what we mean here by loaded data is that the um, view models might also be responsible not only for interacting between different instances that already exist, but also to actually uh, instantiating the various models that, uh, for instance, when uh, starting up an application and loading uh, models from a database or from a web service. So that's another uh, aspect that's the responsibility of the view model typically. Uh, here we can also see how these various main components might be uh, logically grouped together. So on the left here, we might have a first grouping uh, that encompasses both the uh, view and the view model. Uh, here, uh, this, these two would um, represent the application, uh, both the UI and the application logic represented by the view model. Um, on the right instead here, we have the view model and the model that uh, should ideally be uh, platform agnostic. So this is where uh, one of the main strengths of the MVVM pattern comes from. So the idea here is to have uh, reusable view models and models that uh, can be shared across different platforms. And then you would only need to uh, re-implement your UI layer of your application uh, in order to add support for different targets. Or if you're using something like Uno, you might not even do, need to do that at all. Uh, here, once again, we have basically a recap of uh, what we uh, saw so far. So the first layer of the MVVM pattern is the um, view layer, uh, which represents the uh, UI logic. Uh, if you're working with frameworks such as uh, WPF and UWP, uh, this is typically the uh, XAML file, but it can also include uh, anything that really interacts with the uh, UI in any way. So uh, it might include code behind and things such as value converters and attached properties. Again, using markup files is not really necessary. So even if you're using a framework that only uses, uh, for instance, declarative C-sharp language to build the UI, that will still be um, considered the uh, UI layer of your application. Additionally, uh, the view layer also includes uh, any kind of code that um, helps connecting the uh, various components of the view model to the UI. So for instance, if you're using uh, compiled bindings on UWP, um, here you would include also all the generated code uh, that's used to power bindings at runtime. Uh, the second component here is the view model, uh, which as we mentioned is the application logic. Uh, in this case, uh, we said the uh, view model should ideally be uh, platform agnostic to help with code usability. And a good way to force yourself to uh, do this is to uh, physically uh, place your entire backend, so both your uh, view models and your models, in a separate .NET, .NET standard project. Uh, this basically helps to um, force yourself to not be able to reference any kind of platform-specific APIs uh, from your application. 
this in turn um, makes it easy to share this code between different platforms and it also uh, makes it easy to uh, test these various components as they no longer have any kind of dependencies to uh, the UI layer for instance. We also said the view model is responsible for uh, connecting the model to the UI. So in the example I made before, you might imagine the view model exposing a collection of tracks, so a collection of models directly to the UI for the UI to display. Uh, the last component here is the uh, model, uh, which typically represents the uh, business logic or the application domain. So here we said that the uh, model it's typically meant to be the uh, raw data, so the various data items that your application works with. But it can, in some cases, also um, contain code that's used to uh, directly manipulate and transform data. And it also can, in, in some cases, um, contain code that, for instance, interact with uh, services or um, backend stores. Uh, we say it can be here because um, Basically, as long as you uh, keep this separation of these three main components, you might still be, you might still see uh, some slightly different variations or some slightly different takes on the architecture per se, depending on the, um, the team that you're working with or the uh, engineers that you talk to. So for instance, you might see uh, some developers uh, placing services uh, directly within view models and then having models which are basically just raw data without any kind of additional fun functionality uh, added on top of them. And you might see developers in instead um, also using services directly into their models. So in this case, you would also have some business logic uh, being part of the model. So this is to say that there's no really a single way to do this. The important aspect here is to separate your code base um, in these three main uh, building blocks. Here we can see a recap of the actual benefits that working with MVVM um, provides. So why should you even bother working with MVVM? So the first uh, main advantage is that uh, it greatly helps with code reuse. So as we said, uh, you should be able to uh, write your uh, view models and your models just once and then uh, being able to reference them across all the various targets that you might, um, that you choose for your application. Uh, this is also helped by the fact that the uh, view model and the models themselves uh, do not rely on any kind of platform specific um, dependencies. So everything that's strictly platform related would be abstracted through uh, services, for instance. Uh, this in turn also makes the entire architecture easily testable. Uh, so you might be able to test the UI layer on its own, even without an actual backend ready to use, uh, for instance, by using uh, some mock data there. And you might be able to also test the uh, view models separately since they would no longer require any kind of reference to the UI. Uh, so you might be able to use them to test them uh, through, for instance, some mock services. So again, this loosely coupling between components uh, greatly helps a lot in maintenance and in testing. And this last step here, uh, basically, which is the separation of design and development, is basically another way of saying what I just said. So uh, the idea here is that, uh, for instance, when working on a new application from scratch, you might imagine having um, different engineers in the same team uh, working on different aspects of the same app at the same time, which is um, made easier by using this pattern. So you might imagine uh, designers and front-end developers uh, setting up the UI uh, independently, while at the same time the backend engineers uh, would work on setting up the view models and the models. And then as, as long as both agree on the same API surface to share, to connect those various components, uh, they would be able to work at the same time on, on different things, and then they would only need to basically connect these various uh, macro components at the end to build the uh, final working application. Back to you, Michael. Let me, uh, <laughs> Thanks, Sergio. Uh, really appreciate the overview uh, of, of the MVVM pattern. And uh, with that, without further ado, we wanted to introduce what we're calling the MVVM Toolkit, which is going to be a modern, fast, and modular uh, MVVM library that's part of the Windows Community Toolkit. It's going to live in the Microsoft.toolkit.mvvm NuGet package and namespace. Uh, and what really kind of the, the tenants and core, you know, um, uh, pillars that we wanted to build this library on. We wanted to make it .NET standard uh, so that it's platform and runtime agnostic, uh, as Sergio has been, been calling out the benefits there. Uh, we, we really wanted to be agnostic of whatever UI platform you might be leveraging, whether that's UWP, WPF, Blazor, uh, Uno, Avalonia, there's there's so many out there now. Um, we, we didn't want to, uh, we really want to just be able to work for, for any of the ones that you happen to be using and, and really focus on that .NET piece. We also wanted it to be very simple to pick up and, and use. We didn't want it to dictate any specific uh, application or coding requirements beyond the notion that you're using the MVVM pattern and, and some of the general uh, 
tenants and guidance provided by that pattern, but um, it's really flexible so that you can leverage the library um, in any way that you're comfortable with. And as part of that, everything is kind of a la carte. Uh, the components are modular. You can decide which components you want to use. Uh, you're not, you know, required to pull in all the components if you don't want to use them. There, You can pick and choose which ones you want to leverage within your applications. Uh, and we really wanted this to be a lean and performant um, library that's more of a reference implementation. The base class library kind of in infers all these implementations of different components uh, that exist and, and kind of how things should be structured for MVVM, but doesn't always provide the concrete uh, uh, implementations of those interfaces. And so that's what we wanted to provide here. Um, so for a little bit more background, uh, this library was uh, heavily inspired by MVVM Lite um, by Laurent Bagnon, who I think is on the call. So uh, hi, if you are, uh, welcome. And uh, so we started talking uh, in April 2020. Uh, it was really driven by the community. Uh, there was a lot of discussions about, you know, where MVVM Lite was, what kind of support it was going to have for .NET Standard, because there's been a lot of talk about .NET 5 lately, and, you know, where was this project headed? Um, and so we, we really, after talking to Laurent and, and figuring out, you know, what the future of that was, we really decided it would make, make sense to take a step back, look at how we can build something from the ground up with, you know, modern .NET standard implementation in mind, um, really make it highly performant, that look at memory, CPU cycles, um, without necessarily having to be uh, constricted by anything before it. Um, I think in the end, we, we're very highly compatible with MVVM Lite because that was our inspiration. And so we're actually gonna have a migration guide. There's a PR open um, with, with notes on, um, on doing that. And, and a couple of the tests we've done with people porting over have been really quick and, and pretty simple. So we're, uh, we're, we, we, do, we do kind of say that we are, con, um, you know, go, wanna be compatible with MVVM Lite as much as, um, as, much as we can uh, within reason. Um, and so we kind of also thought about, you know, as part of this discussion with the community and Laurent and, and other stakeholders in this space, we're like, why, why do we need a new MVVM uh, framework now? And why, why did we want to do this? And if you look, you know, there's been many frameworks in the past, um, but there's not as many of those that have kind of been currently maintained up until today. Um, both MVVM Lite and Calibre Micro have uh, kind of basically uh, said that they no longer intend to be maintained. So there's there's kind of a, a gap opening in the ecosystem, I think, especially for something um, that's lighter weight and um, easier to pick up and, and use. Um, because a lot of the other frameworks that are still out there have very kind of specific restruct, uh, structures for your apps that are needed. Like they're, they're a little bit heavier use um, to, to pick up. Um, and we also wanted to think, like, if you think about a lot of these libraries and their history, like they were all architected and written um, years ago when, you know, uh, WPF was just kind of becoming a big thing. Like a lot of things have changed in the .NET ecosystem and just application development in general. And so we really wanted to look at this whole picture holistically. How can we build something, take all this input of, you know, what's going on currently and, and you know, the latest innovations in .NET with spans and, and all these great things coming for performance reasons for .NET 5 um, and, and just really start, start fresh and, and see what we can do. Um, and so, so with that, uh, Sergio is gonna kind of introduce a little bit about what the toolkit has to offer and give you a demo. All right, thanks, Michael. Um, so here we can see um, a brief overview of how the actual MVVM toolkit itself is um, structured and how it's uh, built. Uh, here we can see that we basically decided to um, organize all the, all the various features and APIs uh, around four main categories. Uh, the, idea, the idea here, as Michael said, was to um, basically keep all these various categories as uh, self-contained and independent as possible. So uh, this was actually one of the core um, concepts that the toolkit itself was built upon. So here you're completely free to uh, pick any of these available APIs and then combine them or just use one of them. So you're, you're not forced into also using uh, all the other existing helper types. You can just pick the, the ones that you need. Um, so to quickly go uh, through them, uh, the first one would be the uh, component model uh, category, which includes the uh, observable object class. Uh, this is a, a reference implementation for the uh, iNotify property changed interface. Uh, this interface is actually part of the uh, base class library but lacks uh, a concrete implementation which we're uh, providing here. Uh, this interface is uh, crucially important for the uh, MVVM architecture since it's uh, the um, standard interface that's used uh, by UI component to um, 
monitor observed properties to see uh, when their, their, their values has, has, has changed in order for UI components to react in real time. Uh, this base class is basically meant to be used to uh, as a starting point for all kinds of, observ of observable objects uh, that you might need in your application. And it also includes a number of um, helper methods that we can see later on during the demo that helps uh, setting up all these various um, observable properties. The second category is uh, the one that includes commands. So once again, here we have a reference implementation, which we call a relay command, uh, which is a class that implements the I command interface. Now, this is another interface that's part of the um, base class library, and it's the standard interface that's used to um, expose commands from view models to the uh, UI. Uh, we also provide um, some additional APIs here, including some asynchronous support, which, we, which again, we'll, we'll see uh, more during the demo. Uh, the third category includes the uh, messenger. Uh, now, the messenger is a highly performant and memory efficient uh, multicast publisher subscriber helper type, uh, which is basically a very convoluted way to say that it's a helper type that's meant to be used to um, exchange messages uh, across different modules of an application in a loosely coupled fashion. So. Uh, it can be used to notify different components um, about any kind of events that has occurred in your application without having uh, these various components keep a strong reference uh, to the sender or the recipient. So they don't need to know uh, who's sending a given message. And when you send a message, uh, the, uh, you don't actually need to know who is going to uh, be receiving that. So the messenger takes care of that for you. Uh, the last uh, category includes the um, IOC class, uh, which is basically a uh, a reference class that implements the iService provider interface. Now, this interface is uh, part of the base class library again, and it's the uh, standard interface that's used uh, to implement service providers. So those of you uh, coming from an ASP.NET background will probably already be familiar with this interface. So in this case, we're offering this IOC um, class, which is basically meant to be used to support scenarios where you're using the uh, service locator pattern. But we also support the dependency injection pattern, as we'll see uh, during the demo. And again, you're not forced to use any of these approaches. You can pick and choose or combine any of the um, APIs that we have here uh, in your application as you see fit. Uh, so here we can move on to the uh, demo. So let me minimize this and open the demo up. So um, here I crank, I've cranked up the DPI scaling, so you should be hopefully uh, be able to see uh, this properly. So um, this is a simple um, demo app that we've put together in these last few days to um, showcase uh, how the various building blocks of this um, library can be uh, put together and used. Um, we include a number of examples here that showcase any of the additional of the existing APIs, uh, but you're also free to uh, read the documentation or browse the source code if you want to uh, learn more about any of them. So here I can quickly go through uh, the uh, main aspects of the library. So starting from the observable object class. So as we said, this is the uh, base class to use uh, to implement observable objects. And it's a class that implements both the iNotify property changed and the iNotify property changing interfaces. So the way it works is basically implements the uh, required events by these interfaces and it offers a number of helper methods that make it easy to uh, implement observable properties. So here we can see an example of how it works. Um, so one of the uh, main methods that we expose is this uh, set property method. So here we want to implement this observable uh, string name property. Uh, here we have a class user which inherits from observable object. And you can see here uh, in this property where we have a getter that simply returns the uh, backing field for this property. And we have a setter that uh, invokes the set property method, passing a reference to the backing field and then the uh, new value of the property. And basically, uh, by just calling this method with a single line of code, uh, this method will take care of checking whether or not the um, underlying value for the property has changed. If so, it will update the backing field for you and it will also raise the uh, necessary events to notify the UI. Uh, here we have a simple uh, interactive sample to a series in action. Um, you can see here in the backend code, we have this uh, property same as uh, mentioned before. And here in XAML, we have uh, a text box which binds um, to the uh, name property in the view model to its text. You can see here we're binding two ways since we want the text in the text box to also update uh, the value of the uh, property in the view model. And here we have a text block which binds to the same uh, name property this time only in one way mode. So we want it to display the value from the view model as soon as it changes. And you can see here in this example that as I start typing, please, please say test, you can see that the value is 
updating in real time in the uh, text block uh, be below this text box. And this is all made possible by just using this single line of code in your um, view models. Here we have another variation, so another overload of the set property method. Uh, in this case, this one in particular was suggested by uh, one of the members of our um, UWP community Discord server, Emiliano. Um, this method is meant to uh, be used to support scenarios where um, you need to have observable models that wrap um, models that themselves do not have any support for uh, notifications. This might, this might be the case when uh, you're dealing with models that actually come from a third party library that you, that you cannot edit to inject the uh, necessary functionality, or it might be the case when uh, for instance, you have um, objects that are just meant to uh, map directly to, for instance, a database table, and then you also want to uh, write a uh, a wrapping class that simply uh, contains one of these instances and then injects uh, the necessary notification logic by proxying to uh, the uh, properties of this object that you're interested in. So here we can see how it works. Uh, so we have this observable, object, observable user um, class, uh, which in this case simply uh, wraps an instance of this user class and stores that as a field. And here we want to uh, relay the uh, name property of this user, but uh, we also want to inject the notification support. So you can see in this case, we're using set property once um, again, but in this case, we're using the expression instead of a reference. So what this overload will do, it will um, automatically access the uh, wrapping object that we have in our class. It will access the property of that object, and then it will again check if the property has changed. If not, if so, it will update the value, and then it will raise the event for us. So uh, this makes it very easy to um, uh, write uh, wrapping objects for uh, non-observable uh, instances. Uh, lastly, here um, we also decided to add explicit support for uh, task-based properties. So uh, in the past, um, you usually had to resort to um, the notify task completion class, which was basically a wrapping class that was used to uh, basically wrap tasks uh, to expose them to the UI. Here instead we decided to provide uh, native support for this. So the issue was that uh, if you only were to use the set property uh, method as mentioned before for a task property, uh, the events would only be raised uh, when you initially set the property. But then when the task completes after a while, uh, the events would not be raised um, anymore at that point. So instead here we have the special um, set property and notify on completion method, which in this case, um, both uh, checks whether or not the uh, backing field has changed and um, raises the event and it also then starts monitoring the uh, task uh, so that when it completes or falls uh, the necessary property change event is raised again. So here we can see this in action. We have a um, sample view model where we have a task property and you can see here we're just exposing a task directly uh, without the need of any wrapping uh, classes and then here we have this reload task method which simply uh, updates the value of this task uh, with a delay of three seconds in this case and here in the ui uh, you can see we're binding uh, we have a button that binds its, its click event to this reload task method and then we have a text block that simply displays the status um, of this task you can see here that we're uh, accessing the status property of the task directly so we're no longer going through an intermediary like in the past and you can see this uh, in action uh, as soon as i click the button the we can see the waiting for activation status and then after a while the event is automatically raised again and we can see that as run it has run to uh, completion so this is basically an overview of one of the main APIs in Observable Object. Again, there's plenty more of them, so uh, you're welcome to uh, go through the demo app or go through the docs if you're interested. Uh, moving on to the second um, category, which are, uh, includes the commands. Uh, here we have the um, synchronous versions of our commands, which are called relay command and relay commands of T. Um, so here we can see how they work. So uh, instead of just exposing a method directly to the UI as we did in the uh, previous samples, here instead we have um, this I command interface that, that's used to uh, basically abstract uh, this method. So you can see here in the constructor, we're instantiating a new uh, instance of this new relay command class, and we're wrapping this uh, increment counter method. Uh, in this case here, we're using the uh, method group syntax in C-sharp, but you can also use a lambda expression or an inline lambda expression. Both are supported and work perfectly fine. And you can see this in XAML. Um, we have a text block that simply binds to the uh, counter. And then this time we're binding the common property of the, of the button to the button in the, UI, in the view model. We're no longer using the event directly. 
and you can see the here in this sample when we click the button um, the uh, button will invoke the command and then the command in turn will uh, execute the method that it's wrapping and then the method will increment the property and the property will raise the notification and that will in turn update the UI so you can see here uh, that here we basically completely abstracted away all this behavior by using uh, bindings and commands here we also want to mention that we um, decided to provide um, native support for asynchronous operations, which are typically something that's not um, really supported in XAML or in uh, markup languages. So the idea here is that uh, you would usually need to manually track, uh, for instance, Boolean properties to notify the UI about whether or not a given um, asynchronous operations were, was currently being performed. Here instead, we decided to um, offer a class that makes this um, easier to implement for developers. And that's this new uh, async relay command class. So here we can see how it works. Uh, in this case, we have this uh, download text async method, uh, which returns a task of string. Uh, in this case, it's, it's simply waiting for three seconds and then returning the hello world string. Uh, you can see here, we're creating a new instance of this async relay command, uh, wrapping this method. And then we're exposing that as an iAsync relay command interface. Uh, this is one of the interfaces that we're including in the package. And it's meant to provide an additional layer of abstraction uh, that you can use in your backend. So this would allow you to uh, potentially replace the actual um, command type in the future if you wanted to do so uh, without having to also update the UI. Uh, here we can see uh, what kinds of additional uh, features this interface provides. Uh, here, once again, we have a text box, a text block that binds, in this case, to the status. And you can see here that we're accessing the execution task property. Uh, this is one of the properties that are exposed by this iAsync relay um, command interface. And it basically returns the currently executed ta executing task or the task that was returned by the last execution of the method that's wrapped by the uh, current command. So here we can use that to um, display the status of the task. And here we're also displaying the result of the task directly. Uh, now, here you can see here that we're using a, a converter here so, to um, access the result. Uh, this is crucially important in this case since we cannot just uh, bind directly to the result. Uh, this is because if you try to access the result property of a task, uh, that will synchronously block. So if you're running an, an asynchronous operation on the same thread that you're uh, using to block to uh, wait for the result, that, will, that would uh, result in a deadlock in your application. So it will basically freeze uh, forever. So uh, here we're providing uh, this um, converter to help with this, which is actually included in the um, uh, uwp.ui package of the toolkit. Uh, this converter will uh, check whether or not the task has completed, and if not, it will just fall back and return the default value. And if that's completed, instead it will return the actual uh, underlying value for the uh, task, so the result of the task. Uh, lastly here, uh, we can see we have a progress string that binds uh, it, its, uh, its active property to the uh, is running property of the command. So this is the second feature that's exposed by this uh, command interface. And it can be used to easily uh, display, for instance, loading indicators to let the user know uh, that there's some kind of work being done currently in the uh, background. You can see this in action here. So as soon as we click the button, we have this spin uh, progress ring that starts going. And then we have the task, which is initially just waiting for activation. The result is null. And then when the task completes, all the uh, notifications are raised again. And then we can see that the uh, progress ring goes away. And then the result correctly displays uh, our string, hello world. Uh, moving on to the uh, third category, which is the uh, messenger. So as we said, the uh, messenger class uh, can be used to uh, broadcast messages uh, between different components of an application. And the way it works is pretty straightforward. So uh, there's basically four steps to it. Uh, the first one would be to actually uh, define uh, the kind of message that you, uh, that you are interested in or that you want your uh, different components to exchange. So in this case, uh, you can see we're declaring this uh, logged in user change message. And here we're inheriting from this uh, value change message, which is one of the uh, base message types that uh, we're including in the uh, toolkit. You're free to inherit from uh, either of them, or you can just write your own message types from scratch. So here we're using this message to simply uh, notify other components that the uh, current user has changed. So for instance, I'm using something like this in my app, allegedly to uh, notify other components whenever the user changes uh, the current uh, Reddit account that's being used so they can refresh and notify um, and, and reload the new info for the uh, new user. Uh, here, the second step is to basically uh, register a recipient for these messages. So you can see here we're using the uh, messenger.default instance, which is a, a shareable and um, singleton instance of the uh, messenger class. Uh, 
and here we're just calling this uh, register method. In this case, we're uh, specifying here what kind of message uh, we actually want to listen to. Uh, we're using this as the uh, recipient of the message. And then here we're using a Lambda expression to uh, indicate the code that we want to run uh, whenever this recipient receives uh, one of those messages. The last step here is to actually uh, send this message from one of the, from one of the other modules, uh, which is pretty simple to do. You can see here we're once again accessing the uh, messenger default property, and here we're using the send method to broadcast uh, this new uh, message to all the other components. Uh, the last detail here, which is important to consider, is that. Um, uh, when using the MVVM toolkit, we basically require you to um, manually unregister all the recipients uh, when you no longer need them. So this is a crucial difference uh, from the way the messenger class works in MVVM Lite. Uh, we decided to um, not rely on weak references, uh, mostly for performance reasons and also because uh, we thought that in some scenarios um, that approach was a bit error prone since it required developers to have an in-depth knowledge about how uh, closures worked uh, in the c -sharp language, uh, which is not something that every developer knows or should know. Uh, so in this case, uh, you're just uh, required to manually unregister uh, your recipient when you when you no longer need them. So we provide a number of methods to do so. So in this case, you can see uh, this first one uh, is used to unregister a recipient from a specific message type, or we also have this unregister all, uh, which is basically just completely uh, removing all sorts of references to a given recipient. So once you call this on a given recipient, you can be sure that um, the, the messenger class will no longer have any kind of reference to that recipient and the garbage collector will be able to uh, come in uh, when needed and then dispose uh, that uh, recipient. Uh, here we have a sample to actually showcase how this works. Uh, we have two widgets here. Uh, one uh, which sends messages. So you can see um, there is a username property here, Bob, which toggles between Bob and Alice. And then we have a button that when clicked, uh, toggles the uh, property name and then sends a message, which in this case is received by the second widget, uh, which just reads the value of the new username from that message and then updates the uh, local property. You can see here how it works in uh, the uh, view model. Uh, we have the sender view model, which simply has an observable uh, username property and then has this uh, send user message method, uh, which just calls messenger and then sends this new message. And then we have the receiver, uh, which in this case registers from, um, for this message type and then just handles it by uh, reading the new value of the username and assigning that to the uh, username property. You can see here one difference that uh, in this case, we're inheriting from the observable recipient class instead of observable object. Uh, this is one uh, base class that expands the functionalities from observable object. And it's basically meant to offer um, additional support for cases where you're actually using the uh, messenger uh, class. So again, you're free to use that if you want to also use the messenger or you can just use the base uh, observable object class if you're not interested in this kind of functionality. That's completely up to you and there's no uh, mandatory way to approach this. The last category here is the inversion of control. Uh, which is slightly different from the others. So in this case, we decided um, not to roll our own implementation and instead uh, we, we just added a reference to the um, official Microsoft extensions dependency injection package. Uh, this is a very well known and extremely powerful and flexible package uh, that can be used to um, perform dependency injection. So in this, case, uh, in this case, we just decided to offer this IOC class, uh, which provides um, an easy to use access point for these APIs for uh, new developers, and especially for those that are um, interested in using the service locator pattern. Again, both the service locator pattern and the constructor injection pattern are both supported uh, equally as well. You can see here uh, an example of how it works. Uh, we have here this IOC.default instance, which is a, a thread safe and a shared uh, instance of the IOC class. Uh, you're basically meant to uh, invoke this configure services method at startup and then inject all the various services that you might need in your application. So in this case, you can see we're injecting a file service and then a setting service. And then here uh, you can basically just resolve instances of your, of your services uh, from your view models when needed. So in this case, we're once again accessing IOC.default and we're calling uh, the uh, get service method to resolve an instance of our uh, file service. And then we can just use that in the rest of our view models as needed. Uh, we can also see here briefly how um, the constructor injection pattern works. So uh, the main difference here is that uh, whereas the uh, service locator pattern basically uh, expects you to uh, statically resolve uh, each service that you're interested in, um, the constructor injection pattern instead um, 
basically has all the various uh, dependent services for a service or for a view model that are uh, directly injected uh, into it uh, from the constructor. And then it will be responsibility of the uh, DI service provider to uh, recursively resolve all these dependent services for you and to provide you with a ready to use um, instance of that service you, you want to use. So in this case, you can see here, uh, we have this console logger service, which depends on a file service and a console service. And you can see here, we're uh, configuring the services by injecting a file service, a console service, and then finally this console logger service. And then we can just uh, resolve an instance of this uh, iLogger service, and then the, D the DI service provider that's powered once again by the uh, Microsoft extensions dependent injection library will automatically uh, do all the necessary work to resolve all these dependent services for you. So this is just a quick uh, overview of all the uh, existing components. And here we can also see, uh, we've put together a small sample to show uh, how you can actually combine these various building blocks together uh, to build um, a real life application, a real world application, um, or something like that. Here in this case, we have <laughs> this simple um, a Reddit browser, which is basically composed of uh, two widgets. We have a subreddit widget, uh, which basically lets you uh, switch between a number of uh, subreddits. Uh, it will load the posts from that subreddit, and it also has a refresh button, uh, which will also display a loading indicator. And then uh, whenever you click on one of these um, posts, uh, the selection will be broadcast to the other widget, which will display the title, the image, um, if present and also a sample text to display since the content of Reddit posts is actually quite complicated. So here uh, we're just using uh, a sample text. Uh, additionally, we also wanted this um, sample to showcase how you can go about abstracting platform specific uh, dependencies. So in this case, we also wanted this sample to use a uh, setting service. So you can see here, uh, if for instance, we select the uh, Windows Phone subreddit here, uh, we can close the sample up and then reopen it again. And if we navigate to the same sample, uh, you can see that the previous selection is um, kept. So we, we also want to be able to access local settings the, uh, regardless of what, our, of what um, actual application target we are using. So here we can see how you can actually go about building something like this from scratch. Uh, so again, uh, thanks to the MVVM architecture, you can basically tackle this problem step by step uh, from the top to bottom. So in this case, we can start from the uh, view models. So the first step here would be to set up your view models. So uh, as shown earlier, uh, again, we're to quickly go through this, we're, um, we have a subreddit widget view model, which inherits from observable recipient. Uh, we have a command uh, that's used to load posts. We have an observable collection of posts. Uh, we have a, a property that exposes the uh, list of subreddits to choose from. And we have two uh, observable properties uh, that, uh, that represent the selected subreddit and the selected post. Now, this is the uh, first version of the view model without any kind of services and without any additional features. So this is how you would actually start um, initially. We also have this uh, post widget view model. In this case, we're using this iRecipient interface to uh, declare the messages that we're uh, interested in. Uh, this is another um, approach we offer to uh, declare uh, message types to listen to, and you can read more about this in the uh, docs. The important part here is that we're just listening in this property change message. We're checking whether or not it comes from the other widget, and then we're using that to uh, read the new value of the post to update it locally. Uh, here we can see uh, how you would actually go about building services. So in this case, uh, we want we said we wanted to to be able to access settings for a given um, plat platform without having dependencies to uh, platform specific APIs in our view models. So uh, this is basically basically the same approach that you would need to use uh, to build any kind of services for whatever uh, thing you might need. So uh, the approach is pretty straightforward. It's pretty much uh, composed of four steps. So the first one would be to actually decide the uh, API surface that you need. So in this case, you can see we're defining this um, iSetting service interface, uh, which in this case only contains uh, two methods. So we need one to set the, the value of a setting with a given key and one to get the value of that setting. Uh, the second step would be to just uh, basically assume that we had an actual working implementation of this service. Uh, we don't have that yet, but that's that's fine. Uh, we can just assume that we had that, and then we can just start using that service uh, in our uh, view models. So you can see here, uh, we're using the service locator pattern in this case. Uh, 
uh, we're resolving an instance of the setting service here. And then we're using that in the constructor to load the uh, previous selection, if existing, or just the first subreddit, if this is the first time we start the sample. And then we're also modifying the uh, setter of the selected subreddit so that whenever the users changes the selection, uh, we also use the setting service to um, save the value so that it persists when we uh, restart the sample later on. Now that we have the uh, core of our backend working, uh, the, actual, the next step is to uh, actually wire up a platform-specific service that, you, that implements this interface. So in this case, we're working on UWP. Uh, so you can see here, uh, we're using the application data APIs to implement this uh, platform-specific setting service. And here we're just uh, implementing uh, the, uh, these exposed methods for this interface. So we're adding or updating a setting value and here we're retrieving it. The last step, finally, uh, this is, uh, would be done at startup, would be to use the uh, ioc.default.configure service method to actually inject uh, this platform specific service that we've just built. And then the rest of the backend would not need to care, to care at all about the actual um, APIs that the service itself is using. So it only needs to know that it's implementing the contract, so the API uh, that the interface that we define for the service. Uh, we can also quickly go through the uh, Reddit service. Uh, the details are not important here. Uh, we're using Refit, which is a library which allows you to easily um, write code that interacts with REST APIs. So uh, once again, here, where uh, the first step would be to define the interface. So here we have this iReddit service interface, uh, which has a single method in this case, which just, load, uh, which just loads uh, posts from a given subreddit. Uh, here we also have a class. Uh, with our post model, which um, has this uh, title, thumbnail, and self-text properties. And then, um, once again, we're injecting and we're using this service in our view model. So in this case, we're modifying uh, the subreddit widget view model again uh, to use this service. And here in particular, we're uh, finally implementing the actual load posts async method. So you can see here, we're using this service to um, load posts for the currently selected subreddit. And then we're um, adding them to the uh, observable collection so that the UI can display the new posts. Uh, finally, once we have all our backend in place, uh, we just need to um, set up the UI and wire that up with, with the various uh, properties and commands that are exposed by our uh, view models. So in this case here, I've basically just outlined the main components. So we would have the list of items, the uh, combo box selector and the loading bar and the refresh button. And I've removed anything that uh, is strictly related just to the UI. So here the samples are easier to follow. So the first component here is the uh, combo box, which is the selector for the subreddit. Uh, you can see here uh, we're binding the uh, subreddits to the item source and then we're also binding the selected subreddit uh, to the selected item. Uh, you can see here again we're using the uh, two-way binding mode so that we want the, uh, uh, the combo box to actually update the value in our view model whenever the uh, user changes its selection. Here we're using a XAML behavior to uh, invoke our command whenever the selection change uh, method is um, raised. So again uh, using XAML behaviors is just an easy way to um, just use XAML uh, code to uh, wire up events to commands, but if you're not familiar with them or if you just prefer to uh, use code behind for whatever reason, you can just wire this uh, command manually in code behind. Uh, that's perfectly fine and we support both scenarios, so that's completely up to you. Uh, the next component here will be the refresh button, which is a simple button that just binds uh, its command to the uh, load post command, which is the same one we used here. Uh, then we have a list view control, which is used to display the various posts that we loaded. Uh, you can see here uh, we're binding the item source to the uh, posts, and then here we're binding the selected post two ways again uh, to the um, selected item. Um, here we also have a template uh, which is used to display each individual post. You can see here we're using compiled bindings on, on UWP, so we need to define the uh, data type we're using. In this case, uh, each item will be a post instance, so that's the model we defined earlier in the uh, Reddit service. And here you can see uh, we have a simple grid uh, which contains a text block binding to the title and then an image binding to the thumbnail. Uh, this image EX control is from the um, controls package in the uh, toolkit as well. Uh, lastly, we have this um, progress bar, which uh, once again uh, uses the uh, is running property from the asynchronous command uh, to easily uh, just be hidden or displayed whenever the uh, command is actually ru running. So whenever we're actually loading posts. And finally, we have the uh, code for the uh, post widget, which is very simple. We, have a sim we, have, we just have a header here, uh, which just binds the uh, text here to the title of the post and the same image control to the thumbnail. And then we have the self text property bound to a text block here, which is inside the scroll viewer to enable the vertical scrolling. And 
basically that's all there is to it. So here you have your final working example. So you can scroll posts, you can refresh the selection, uh, you can toggle between subreddits and you can uh, cycle through posts and have them uh, show up in the second widget. If you're interested here, uh, we also have in the, uh, we also have the full uh, markup source and also the full uh, code behind source. Uh, let me just go back to the uh, presentation here so that Michael can chime in. Thanks, Sergio. All right. <laughs> so, um, so the great news with the MVVM toolkit is that you can download the preview today. The uh, Microsoft.toolkit.mvvm package is live on uh, NuGet. Uh, you can also go to the link here, aka.ms/mvvmtoolkit, to go to uh, the sample repo, which has the app that Sergio just demoed, uh, as well as our initial documentation. And so we, we welcome any feedback and input. Uh, we're also looking to create samples for other platforms. Uh, what, I know one of the community members has already um, done some WPF work. Uh, we have one of our uh, MVPs who's been working with uh, Uno for us. Um, we're looking for others that have more expertise in Xamarin and in Blazor or Avalonia to, to help join with us and, and work on, on samples for that. Um, and, and just try things out, give us feedback. We, we want to ship this as part of our uh, next major release of the Windows Community Toolkit that's going to be later this year. I'll talk a little bit more about those plans in a second. Uh, and then we're also been talking to the Windows Template Studio support uh, folks for support there. Uh, they have an issue up on their GitHub repo number 3753, so um, be sure to uh, um, follow that for any status uh, on that. Um, I just wanted to kind of close things off uh, and, and one last time, you know, just per, uh, curtailing any questions about, you know, what about whatever specific platform and, you know, we really want this library to be platform agnostic, really focusing on the core .NET pieces um, and, and kind of use a strategy of encouraging app developers for their specific platform to look at these samples that we want to build for each of these platforms to understand how best to uh, integrate these and, and maybe get um, through some of those more nuanced things like Sergio was saying uh, with tasks in C Sharp and UWP integration, there's, there's some issues there and we have a helper perchance in the uh, Windows Community Toolkit already, but you know, what other things can we just have as part of samples to help with, with that little bit of extra um, extra space, um, or we encourage others to, you know, build upon this library as a core piece and and do some, you know, pattern simplifications for their platform. Um, we, we really just want to focus on the core elements of what's what can be purely .NET based in this library. Um, and of course, there's other, um, if, if they needed, um, we have um, different um, .NET Foundation projects such as MVVM Cross and Prism, which are larger uh, MVVM libraries that, that um, provide uh, different feature sets or um, are already kind of tailored to specific platforms. Um, so we, you know, we, we want to try to look at this, this approach holistically, really make sure we're keeping uh, this library as lean and straightforward as possible. We want to keep it simple to use, keep it performant, um, and and really um, really look to making sure we have worked with people to build samples that show how best to light it up within their environment. Um, in terms of the toolkit itself, uh, we just shipped our 6.1 release uh, last June. Uh, the big marquee updated control, or the big updated new control there was the tokenizing text box, which is pretty cool if you haven't uh, seen it yet. Uh, this release was also jam packed uh, with some of the largest uh, community contribution, largest number of community contributions we've had in, in uh, a long time. Uh, so we're really happy to, um, to, to have a lot of these great features from the community coming in. We worked with Dot Morton uh, to to bring in uh, their state trigger library and make some updates there. Uh, Sean added some items repeater layouts for uh, from what was wrap panel and staggered panel. Now we have items repeater equivalents for those. Uh, Sergio himself here added some uh, amazing effect brushes, including the pipeline brush, as well as uh, some other .NET standard API. So if you're doing anything .NET based, uh, be sure to check out the guard and high performance packages from Sergio as well that are part of the Windows Community Toolkit. Uh, for 7.0, we're kind of still figuring out our release date. It should be sometime this year, later this year. Um, we're, we're kind of figuring that out. We want to do a lot of cleanups and optimizations and, um, and really um, uh, look at the, the toolkit as a whole, figure out what, what we should be focusing on, how we can, can make our dependencies a little bit leaner and uh, for, for certain scenarios. 
So that's a lot of work we're going to be planning out in the next few weeks and, and figuring out a plan for. Uh, but of course, we also are going to have this .NET standard MVVM library. I'm also looking still at those Microsoft graph controls, um, and I'll actually be talking more of those about those tomorrow. I'll get to that in a second as well. And then finally, uh, we have uh, what we've been calling the 8.0 release, uh, which will happen sometime next year, where the toolkit will actually take WinUI 3 as a dependency. And this is really to kind of give us a stable single base of code to work off of, to build on top of for the toolkit, uh, you know, leverage all the um, testing and requirements that the base library that WinUI 3 is going to do to, to ship across OS versions. And then we can just focus making sure the toolkit works on top of WinUI 3, then having to deal with all those idiosyncrasies between every different uh, version of Windows that, that's uh, out there that people are trying to use the toolkit on. And then, of course, we get to leverage uh, improvements to the platform controls right away by doing that. We can just update our WinUI 3 dependency and then get, uh, get all those fixes 